A firefighter edges into a smoldering bedroom, crouching low to avoid the dense smoke banked down from the ceiling. He inches forward in the near darkness, feeling the oppressive, oven-like heat right through his heavy turnout clothing, feeling for a child still unaccounted for. He reaches out. Just then, flame erupts all around him. Heat shoots up to a thousand degrees, so hot it sears unprotected skin, blinds a man with excruciating pain, melts his mask and sets his clothing on fire. Wrapped in a blazing inferno, he has only seconds to get out. A few scant seconds before he's trapped and overcome. Flash over. It's a leading cause of death and injury to firefighters in America. It's the most deadly stage of a fire. Flashover can happen suddenly, and when it happens with firefighters in a room, the results can be deadly. This videotape will tell you exactly what flashover is, what are its warning signs, how to assess the risk of flashover, and survival techniques you can use to minimize that risk. This training program will also help you avoid being trapped in a flashover during search and rescue operations. Every fire has three stages the growth stage, the fully developed stage, and the decay stage. Flashover occurs at the end of the growth stage. It can be identified on a fire curve by a steep vertical rise. The temperature of a room that flashes over is 1,000 to 1,500 degrees. What causes flashover? The scientific explanation is a theory called thermal radiation feedback. Heat from a room fire rises to the ceiling. It can't readily escape, so it just builds up. At first, the ceiling and upper walls absorb a lot of this heat. But at a certain point, they begin radiating it back into the room. This feedback heat accelerates burning of the combustible contents of the room. More important, it raises the temperature of the combustible gases that the fire is producing. At first, these gases don't ignite. But as the fire progresses and they reach their ignition temperature, the whole room bursts into flame instantaneously. Nobody can really predict when a flashover will occur. At some fires, a room becomes a sudden inferno the moment you enter it. At other fires, you can search for long periods of time before flashover occurs. And sometimes there is no flashover at all. General statements such as four minutes until flashover cannot be used by firefighters as a safety guide for estimating time periods of search and rescue operations. Forget the time rule. Look out for warning signs of flashover instead. The main indicator of impending flashover is heat buildup in a smoke-filled room. It actually triggers flashover because for flashover to occur, the combustible gases in the room must be heated to their ignition temperature, 1,000 to 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. If you crawl into a smoke-filled room and there's not much heat, then there's little immediate danger of flashover. But if there's enough heat to make you drop down to your knees, flashover is a real possibility. Rollover is another sign that flashover is about to happen. It's a term that describes small, sporadic flashes of flame that appear at ceiling level in a smoke-filled room. These flashes can also occur in the smoke pouring out of the top of an open doorway or window. Rollover is a reliable signal, but you may not be able to see it above your head, especially if you're crawling around in a smoke-filled room. Then, suddenly, flashover. The speed with which flashover will occur depends on a number of variables. Room size, for example. Suppose two different rooms one small, one large, are on fire. In each, the fire is of equal size and intensity. Which one will flash over first? The small one. Why? Because the small room will fill up with heat and smoke faster, and the close proximity of the walls will cause faster thermal radiation feedback. Keep in mind that most fires occur in residences with small rooms. So fires in dwellings must be considered a primary flashover danger. Whatever causes a room fire to burn hotter faster will cause flashover. The flammability of building materials makes a difference. Sheetrock and plaster don't burn, but wood paneling is highly combustible. 
The heat transfer properties of walls and ceilings also affect the speed of flashover. The more insulation behind a ceiling or wall, the faster heat will radiate back into the room and the faster flashover will occur. And what about the combustibility of a room's contents? What's burning? How hot does it burn? How much smoke does it generate? Home and office furnishings used to consist of natural materials like wood, leather, wool, or cotton. Today, drapes, rugs, furniture, and bedding are more likely to be made of plastics and other synthetics. Lab tests show that a pound of wood or paper gives off 7,000 to 8,000 BTUs when burned. A pound of polyurethane, like that used in upholstery and bedding, gives off about 12,000 BTUs, and polystyrene jumps all the way to 18,000. With plastic furnishings, you get a hotter fire faster, and more possibility of rapid flashover. Burning synthetics also generate dense smoke quickly. Smoke may hide the telltale flicker of rollover that warns you to get out. And when you do try to abort your search and rescue, the smoke may be too dense for you to find your way out. Firefighters searching smoke-filled rooms are killed and injured each year by sudden flashover. One reason is that firefighters get to the fire more quickly these days. Smoke detectors installed in residence buildings call us to the scene before a fire reaches flashover. That's good because we save more lives and property. It's bad because we face the danger of flashover more often. Progress in protective firefighting gear has also made firefighting a riskier business. On the one hand, it protects us better from flame and smoke. On the other, it encourages a more aggressive search and rescue operation. Firefighters are penetrating deeper into burning buildings to search for trapped victims. The deeper they crawl into a burning room, the greater the danger of being trapped by flashover. You've got to guard against over-reliance on your protective equipment. Flashover instantly changes a fire from the growth stage to the fully developed stage. That means more flame, more chance of it spreading to other areas, more heat. Flashover signals the end of an effective search effort. Anyone in the burning room is dead. A powerful attack hose line is now required to extinguish the fire before the search can continue. After a fire flashes over, you also have to consider the danger of structural collapse. Before flashover, only the contents of the room were burning. After flashover, the flames start to attack the structure. Ceilings, roof beams, and floors may collapse if the fire is not extinguished. It's important to prevent or delay flashover whenever possible. The buildup of heat is the key factor. If you can keep temperature down, you can stop flashover. The best way to do this is to get water on the flames and extinguish the fire quickly. But it's not always possible to get an attack hose line in operation soon enough. The next best thing is to prevent heat buildup by venting. When you vent heat and smoke, you delay the buildup necessary for flashover. If the room in question has a skylight, vent it. Do it as soon as possible. Vertical ventilation may well delay flashover long enough to search and assist in advancing an attack hose line. Even if the room flashes over, the flames will be diverted upward. But venting a burning room is not always the appropriate technique. If the room is filled with superheated smoke down to the floor level and you can see rollover, don't vent the fire area. Instead, close the door. By closing the door to a burning room in the growth stage, you may starve the fire of oxygen and delay the buildup of heat necessary for flashover. So before you vent, ask yourself, how is venting going to alter the fire conditions in the burning room? How will it affect flashover? It would be great if I could stand here and tell you that it's always possible to avoid being trapped in a flashover, but I cannot. Most firefighters killed in flashover are trapped during search and rescue operations. What I can do is tell you how to protect yourself when searching, by using safe search procedures and by following basic survival techniques. Firefighting safety begins with training and training begins with fire ground pre-planning. Knowing the buildings in your community can reduce the chances of becoming disoriented during search operations. Tract houses, apartments, and developments usually have similar plans throughout. 
Knowing where exits, windows, dead-end corridors, fire escapes and stairways are located can reduce the chances of being caught in a flashover. Quick access pre-plans showing interior layouts can give you life-saving information. On the fire ground, wear all your protective equipment. Check out your breathing apparatus before you begin the search. And always carry a light. Check for signs of flashover before you begin any search and rescue operation. At the doorway or window leading to a burning room, first check the smoke pouring out of the opening. Look for flashes of flame that warn you flashover may occur. If the heat level is low, if you don't have to crouch down on your knees to escape the heat, continue your search and rescue. The most effective defense against being trapped in a flashover is to search in an organized search pattern. When you search a small room, always work your way around it in one direction. Stay in contact with the walls. When moving down a hallway, keep one shoulder in touch with the wall at all times. And when you exit, your other shoulder touches the same wall. When searching a large area, use a 75 or 100 foot search rope as a guide. Attach the rope to a fixed object near the doorway and play it out as you search. The rope will guide you to safety when your visibility is reduced. Stay on the lookout for heat buildup or flashes of fire in the smoke. If these danger signs of flashover appear, practice defensive search procedures. For example, check behind the door for an unconscious person. Sweep the floor area around the doorway for a victim using a tool or your hand. If necessary, crawl a few feet inside the room. But don't, under any circumstances, go more than five feet inside the doorway. This is the point of no return, so-called because it's the maximum distance a firefighter can crawl into a burning room about to flash over and still get out alive. Why five feet? Well, fully equipped, a firefighter can crawl about two and a half feet a second. In a room that has flashed over, temperatures reach 1,000 to 1,500 degrees. About two seconds, one, two, is as much time as anyone can survive. Two times two and a half feet equals five feet. So five feet into that room is your absolute limit. After your limited search, close the door fast to cut down the oxygen supply. Then wait for the hose line. When it's ready, open the door and move in behind the hose attack team to complete your search. Sometimes a victim can be saved by a firefighter through a window. Don't climb inside if a flashover is imminent, or if flame and smoke is erupting out the top. Reach over the sill with a gloved hand or tool and sweep the area below and beside the window. People sometimes are found unconscious but alive, slumped below the window. Periodic checks for heat buildup should be carried out during a prolonged search in a smoke-filled area. Raise a hand up into the smoke or attempt to stand up. If it's too hot, get out, and go out the way you came in so you don't get lost. Do your pre-planning. Wear your protective gear. Follow an organized search plan. Stay alert for flashover warning signs. Use safe search procedures. Do not go beyond the point of no return. Fight the fire defensively. All these are proven survival techniques. Learn them. Use them. They could save your life someday. You can't avoid the risk of flashover during firefighting operations, but you can learn how to survive its deadly consequences. We hope this videotape will help you do that. Good luck.